Good morning, everybody. Um, who here is horribly hungover? A few. Well, hopefully this won't be too taxing on the mind, but hopefully interesting at the same time. So today I'm going to talk about Scala Clean, which is an open source project. Um, I started back in January with another guy called Mike Skells, um, doing hopefully interesting things and hopefully discovering interesting things about my source code and about your source code. But I have uh, one confession at the start of the, the start of the talk, which is uh, if you've ever written a talk and you submit an abstract for a conference and you're like, OK, I've got five months. By the time I get to the end of five months, it's going to be perfect. It's going to be ready. I'm going to run it on everything. Yeah, it's not quite as true as I'd hoped. So we have tested it. It does work on our small test project. And of course, what happened is we promptly went along and tried to run it on a bigger project. And if you've ever done that, it then fell apart in new and fun and interesting ways. And we're still trying to debug a couple of those uh, new edge cases that we found. So it does work, but only for some cases. And we're going to make it work for all the other cases. So let's, let's go back a step before I really start talking about what we're doing. And I want to talk a little bit about, about software quality. Now, the fun part about software quality, as all of you know, is we don't build statues. Right? We don't build pieces that go in a museum and are beautiful and are complete and done. We build edifices that we then add an extra floor to. Or somebody decides to put a swimming pool on the top floor. And suddenly, all the foundations aren't quite as good as they were. And in fact, I look back at, at LaTeX. Who here uses LaTeX or has used LaTeX? Yeah. So LaTeX was originally released in 1983. And there was a bug bounty on it. There's bug bounties for finding bugs in LaTeX. Do you want to know when the last release of LaTeX was? Anybody want to make a guess? November 2018. So LaTeX you would consider complete, but it's, it's evolved and fixed and bugs. Software is a continually evolving process. And the problem is, it is we talk about technical debt, and we all talk about the debt the projects build up, but the thing about technical debt is the truth is it continually accrues. As we're building software, debt accrues, and it doesn't matter how good a programmer you are. Right? You will... As, you, as your software changes and evolves, bits will die, bits will be added, new bugs will be introduced. Bugs that have been there since 1983 will suddenly be found and suddenly be critical. And one of the challenges is measuring it is really hard. How good is your software? Is your, who here writes amazing, great, magical software that's perfect? That guy at the back, hire him. But my point is, you know, we all build bugs, right? I, I turn coffee into bugs and then turn more coffee, hopefully, into fewer bugs. But that... Paying it back is hard. Right? As you build software, keeping the noise down to a dull roar is hard. And it slows you down. We talk about technical debt, and, and you can talk about, think about it as like mortgage interest. So you can either have a repayment mortgage or interest only. Interest only mortgages, you're basically servicing the debt. But in, in 20 years' time, the debt's still there. You've still got to keep paying. And sometimes you can pay a bit more, and you can reduce the debt a bit, but it still evolves. And as you add an extension, you're going to borrow some more from the bank and keep playing it. And we keep doing this, right? We, we, how do we do this? We keep our software good through processes, code reviews, automation, bug finders, all those kind of things. But should we care? And is it important? And well, Martin Fowler certainly thinks so. And what's really interesting for me is this is one of the first books I owned about software quality, which is Writing Solid Code, which was released in 1993. And actually, if you go back and read it, it is really dated now. But a bunch of the stuff in there is actually really important still. So how do we keep code clean? Well, conscious design. We actively work on caring about what our, our code quality. 
my biggest advice, if you take nothing else from this talk, don't reinvent the wheel. You might think that you know how to write a logging framework better, but you don't. And at some point, you'll come back and go, OK, now I'm going to rip out all my own logging, and I'm going to put in log for j because it was the right answer all along. Or I've walked into a company, and what do they have? They have their own actor framework. Was it any good? Was it better than Acker? No. Right? You've got to keep working at it as well. You've got to keep evolving your code, keep caring about it, keep reevaluating what you've done. I come back to code six months later and go, oof, this stuff's awful, right? And you've got to work on both the design and the housekeeping. And I hear many people in the room go, but surely there's the there's scholar style and, and water remover and scapegoat and linter and scholar C minus X lint and IntelliJ code inspections and code coverage tools and scholar fix. Surely, surely we've got this space covered. Right. Who here runs any of those automatically on their code on a daily basis? OK, I'm just going to quit my talk now and go home. Right? <laughs> well done, everybody. A lot of projects I've come across and worked on, you come in and they've never run, never even thought about running any of these. And my challenge to you, if, you've, if you haven't run any one of these tools on your code, go and run it on your code. And I can guarantee you might not agree with everything it says, but it'll find at least one bug. I, I challenge you, and I, I will buy you beer if you run these tools on your code and they don't find something that makes you go, hmm. You know. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to... I have lots of slides that people can look at if they care about looking at my slides later about what these individual tools do, and I'm going to sort of skip through that entire lot. But there are hundreds of rules. Uh, there's a lot of crossover between the tools. But they tend to check for local things. Right? It's very easy to detect, does, does someone have the word null in their code? Do they, do, do they compare an int and a string, which is never going to compare to true? Right? Do they do unsafe things? And all those are very useful, and they're, they're absolutely correct. And you should run these codes. If, if you're comparing an int and a string, you're doing something wrong, and your code is incorrect. Go and fix it. You'll find they can be quite opinionated. So if you don't agree with the programming style of the author, you're going to find these tools flag a lot of stuff that you're OK with. For example, I'm perfectly fine with a var inside a function. I know a lot of people in the room might not feel that's the right answer, but occasionally it is. As I say, they'll, they'll find things wrong with your code. So, so what's wrong with all these tools? Well, they tend to work at the local information level. And there's a bunch of things they cannot tell you about the code. So, for example, who calls foo? Who calls this method? Now, IntelliJ will tell you. You can ask it. And Metals will tell you. But the linter tools tend to look at the direct data that's physically there. So it looks at the jar file, or it looks at the semantic DB file. Or who extends this? Um, if you've ever tried to get the, the language to tell you what are the subclasses of this class, you'll know why this is a problem, because often it's just the runtime at the node knows what classes, there are subclasses of the class you want that are loaded at this point. But they don't necessarily know all of the subclasses of a class. The problem is, is when we talk about jars and when we talk about semantic DB, those pieces of information contain forward references. When you're running code, when your JVM is running your code, it doesn't care about who calls foo. What it cares about is who foo calls. And the jar file effectively contains, it says, you know, this method is defined by calling this method and doing this. Right? And it, it will tell you exactly which classes it depends on. 
but not who depends on it. And that information doesn't exist in your jar. You have to compute it. In fact, when you open IntelliJ and you import a project for the first time, that's exactly what it's doing. When you open a big project and it grinds away for a bit, it's effectively <coughs> indexing it. But what's interesting about this is this is a pure graph problem. Right? We can generate these graphs. Right? The information is there, but effectively you have to take all the forward references and do a reverse index on it. Then we can do interesting graph things. We can color it. And you can start to tell really interesting things about the program. So the simple case is, for example, is find uses. Right? Because now I have, not from, from foo, I've got a bi-directional graph. I know who calls it and what it calls. And the dependency hierarchy is easy. Right? Because I've looked at the forward references, I've found all the places in the code that talk about class A, so I now have the list. Well, what does this method override? You know, what's the, what's the hierarchy? But you need to trace it back from the source and, and generate this information. One of the problems with graph things is when I show you an example on the slide, the graph is really trivial. Right? It's got, you know, four links. But even if I just look at the build graph of a project, Suddenly, it's, it's so big that I can no longer reason about it. What's the critical path in this, in this dependency tree? If this is a build graph? Don't know. Now, OK, let, let's, go, let's go one step further. Let, let's look at a real program instead of just looking at the, the build modules. Right. What can you infer about this? Right. So these dependency graphs are huge. If you think about your program, if you take any, any function in your program, how many other functions does it call? Right? I, I would suggest your fan out factor is at least five, probably higher, even for well written tiny little functions. So these graphs get very big very fast. So how do we reason about them then? Well, we use programs to reason about them. We don't do it ourselves. You, you can't. I, I can't. I, I work on projects that are big enough, even medium-sized projects, I can no longer keep it all in my head. Right? I don't know, I assume everybody else has this problem as well, but once a program grows beyond a few files, you, you forget stuff, and you rely on the fact that you build in a certain way and your name in a certain convention to find things. So what's the plan? Well, the plan's easy. Capture the dependency graph for the whole project. It is practically CSVs, right? It's just a list of references. And use that analysis to do interesting things. There is a challenge here. This is whole program analysis, right? which is you need to have a closed world assumption, which is if I'm analyzing a program, you know, if I want to say this method is unused, I need to have all possible callers of that method within the scope of the thing I'm looking at. Otherwise, well, I'm lying to myself. Which means you need to find the entry points. Now, obviously, the main method is easy. If you're using certain test frameworks, you can use the annotations to find them. If you're, if you're writing a library, you're going to have to tell the tool where your entry points are. What are your public APIs? Actually, I think that's a generally useful uh, thing to do anyway. Things that a tool can't automatically do is, for example, if I load something reflectively, I can't see it, right? It's, it's magic. So if you're going to do that, you're going to need to provide these tools extra information and say, this is an entry point. So how do we capture the information? Well. We started using SemanticDB and Scala Meta. So in fact, I started writing this as a Scala fix rule. 
Okay? In fact, it turns into two scholarfix rules. The first one goes over the code and does the analysis and returns no result. And the second one then applies the transformations. Because scholarfix does one file at a time. It loads a file, it gives you the semantic information, and it says, what do you want to do with this file? And it's like, well, I haven't yet got the back graphs. So what I do is I go through it the first time, effectively run, run the analysis rule, and that spits out a, f a bunch of files, and then I run a modification rule which goes through and does the logic. But you do end up having to use scholar reflection and Java reflection to get certain information out as well. There's, there's a bunch of things that you have to sort of tie the knot. And I'm gonna, I might come back to that if I have time a bit later. Um, there's probably more stuff that needs, for me, needs to go into SemanticDB um, to make this easier. So given all these caveats and all these warnings, what can we do? Well, it turns out I can do a bunch of really interesting stuff. So the first one is dead code detection. Once I have the entry points, I can do simple graph coloring. Basically, you go through the graph, you color the entry points, and for every method that, that those entry points touch, you color those, and you keep going until, you, until there's nothing left to color. And anything left uncolored is dead. Right? It's unreachable from the entry points of your program. It cannot be executed by your program. Great. One of the fun ones that I thought was just a, a nice little side effect, and it's turned out, I think, to be quite important, is privacy scoping. I'm going to go through all these in more detail in a bit. But, but take your program. Scala is public by default. And if you uh, saw Daniela's talk, one of her things was you should define your APIs. If you're going to write a, a class, you should define what your public API is. But the fact is, once you get to a certain style, it's like you need to then go through each method and go, who calls this? Is it public? Is it private? It's a pain. And you can do this automatically. And it's actually really trivial. Once you've got the backlinks, this is trivial. Right? I, can, I can look at a method and go, uh, the only people that call this are inside this package. I can make it package private. Or it's, I can scope it perfectly. One of the other ones, looking at uh, Stu Hood's talk yesterday, is build diamonds. You find your build dependency, your, your dependency graph in builds, tends to have weird patterns in it. Um, I'll come back to exactly what a build diamond is later, because it's, it's easier to describe with a diagram. And there's a bunch of other cleanups. And, and I'm sure that once this is mature, there'll be a bunch of stuff that I haven't even thought of, that people go, oh, yeah, I can do this. I can detect. In fact, Diego, if he's in the room, actually came up with something and raised a ticket before the software was even ready to run, which is great. So let's, uh, let's have a look at dead code analysis. Now, finding dead code is hard to do manually. It's, IntelliJ will tell you if you've got a private method which is uncalled. Great. As we said, most of my methods aren't private because I haven't got around to doing the, the scoping thing. But the problem is, when you're looking at code, I've, I've spent days trying to refactor a piece of code. And I'm sure I'm not the only person in the room. Trying to fix a piece of code, days and days and days, refactoring, fiddling, trying to get the new API to work with the old API, to discover, after two days, that the entire chunk of code is dead. Right? It's just dead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, trust me, if, if you're new to the industry, at some point, you will have this problem. You will come across code, and you're like, this, ah! And it drives you slowly bonkers. But also, IntelliJ will tell you, this is called, you know, foo is called by bar, and bar is called by something else. And, and you can't immediately see, maybe, you can't immediately see that the code is dead. You know, sometimes it's trivial. It's like, oh, yes, this method is unused. Delete it. Right, gone. Great. But often not. Circular references, are another, as I say, you can't, you can't see it by simple inspection. And those can be huge chains of methods or huge subgraphs. I have a personal belief that if you take any large enough code base, 
if, I, if I'm conservative, I'm going to say 20% of the code is dead, especially if the code's evolved over, over like a 10-year project. I think I personally, I want to run this on some really large code bases and try and try and prove this. But I think, I think it's at least 20%. And actually, I lean towards 30% of any any large code base is just dead code. But hopefully, I'll prove that uh, soon. Obviously, it's easier in pure functional code because you tend to have functions that, you know, there's not that you don't have the dependencies, you don't have instanc instantiation, all that stuff. It's it's a lot easier. But it's it is simply a graph coloring problem. As I said, you color from the entry points and possibly the tests. And, and one of the interesting things is you can do the analysis that says, well, this code is touched by test code, but it's not, not reachable by, by the, the main code. You know, that's an interesting analysis. It's, it's great having tests, but are you testing something that you actually care about? And anything that is not colored is dead by definition. And so you can compare which breach. So let's uh, give you a quick example. So here's my, my trivial code. So to color, you start with the entry points. You mark those. You then go through any of those. And you say the main method calls bar. So bar is live. And we can easily detect. Now, obviously, this is a trivial slide example. But it doesn't matter how big the graph is. You iterate coloring the graph until, it's, until you can color no more. And it will work, and it will work on cycles, and it will work on all, all the other parts. But there are some limitations. It can be, as I said, really difficult to detect the entry points. If you've got a specialist API loading your code, you're either going to have to mark it or add logic to the tool to tell you what the entry point is. Um, if you use reflection aggressively, this is not going to work. You, again, you're going to have to provide hints. Um, and the solution is simple, right? You either annotate or you add config. But it's actually really easy to do. And I think it's going to provide some really interesting things. And, and the fun part is what I then did is my Scholarfix rule went and deleted the unreachable code. And the beauty is it's really fun because you run the tool and I, I give you a code base. And the guarantee is this code base must compile beforehand. Because otherwise, they all bets are off, right? And it must compile afterwards and still pass the tests. And if it does that, I've won, right? I've, I've reduced your code complexity for free. So it can be difficult to detect the entry points. Same slide again. So privatization. Now, this is the, the second use case I've, I've been playing with. And the, the idea is simple. Right? Reduce the scope of everything to the minimum it's allowed to be to make your program still function. Again, if I run this rule, what I expect is I expect your program to compile and run beforehand, and I expect it to compile and run afterwards with no visible differences. Right? In fact, I, either it will compile or it won't compile afterwards, because why would you do this? Well, it's good practice. Right? Minimizing your scope of things is good for your program. It's good for your developers. It's good for your users. If you're a library author, you know, having everything public is just is just an anti-pattern. In fact, it actually really helps code completion. This is one of the use cases I think actually where this is going to come out to be really useful for larger code bases. It helps incremental compilation. Your code will compile faster. And uh, if you saw uh, Stu Hood's talk yesterday um, about pipeline compilation, it helps that as well, because it helps things like outline typing. So here's another trivial program. Um, how does privatization help us? It, it hides methods that we don't care about. So if I just have public methods and I use you know, suggest code, you know, dot control space, it suggests all three methods. And the answer is that actually it suggests methods alphabetically about methods they don't care about. If I put appropriate scoping on these, IntelliJ does a better job of suggesting 
what the right completions are. Right? This makes your life and my life easier. Because I don't know about you, but I've opened code where I've imported a library or something and I've gone, what methods does it have? And it <laughs> so how does it help with incremental compilation? Well, it reduces the dependencies between files. So Zinc has to decide what to compile. Right? If your public API of your class changes at all, it goes, who depends on this file? And it goes, has to go and compile those as well. So reducing your scopes and your APIs means it invalidates fewer files. So if you are only changing the private implementation of a method, of a class, and you haven't changed the public API, Zinc can be much smarter about it and get away with only compiling that class. Right? So you're helping the compiler detect things and make your life better. So the last part, for me, is one of the, the sort of golden nuggets of this, is we can make compilation in general faster by doing this stuff. Um, outline typing. So I'm going to describe this in a little bit more detail, but what you, want to do, what you can do, if you've got module A and module B, what happens at the moment is you compile module A, you get a jar, and you feed that into module B. Right, so your dependency is effectively at the, at the binary level. But actually, most of the time, in most of the cases, what you actually need to compile module B is simply the public API of module A. You need the types and you need the classes, but you don't actually need the internal implementations of those methods. And in fact, uh, Stu was talking yesterday about that, that Google do this for, for a Java. There's a Java tool that sort of cheats. It generates an, an iJar, which is an interface jar, which is effectively a, the minimum jar you can generate with just effectively empty methods and the outlines of the classes in. Because that's enough for the next stage to compile, not to run, but to compile. And obviously, privatization is a great step in, minima in working out what that public API is. So let's, uh, let, let's walk through this. So here's my, here's my simple build. I'm not going to add timelines, because you can imagine that where we go. So I have many, many cores on my machine, even on my really old laptop now. And my compiler is singly threaded. So let's, let's be smart. Here's my, here's my two modules, and they're compiled one after the other. But in fact, if I start to break down the compilation, I'm going to trivially break it into three phases, which is parsing the files, type checking everything, and then generating jars and, and, and doing all the other housekeeping. Well, actually, I could start by doing the parsing at the same time. There's nothing stopping me par doing the parsing simultaneously. But once we start using outline typing to do the work, in fact, you can do better. So I can parse at the same time. But module two only depends on the result of outline typing in module one. So I can now start paralyzing them much earlier. And module three, so now I, I'm doing a lot more work. And assuming I've got enough cores, and in fact, one of the interesting things is I can buy cores off Amazon. Right? I, can, I can start, once I can start lifting this stuff, you can, I can have as many cores as I need for short periods of time. And one of the key things is actually parsing doesn't take very long. What makes, but what you want to do then is minimize the amount of time to get to the end of outline typing. Right? That is your critical path in compiling then. All the other stuff is, is, is noise, right? Because if I've got enough modules, they're all now going to overlap, and I'm going to start running out of cores. How do I improve outline typing? Well, I want, what, do I, what do I need to provide the compiler to do outline typing? Well, it needs to know the public methods and the types. So I can do two things, right? Number one is I can minimize the number of public methods. And number two, I can go and run ScalaFix and say, for all those public methods, now ascribe the types. 
So I've now got a really small surface that's really easy to compile. And then you can go one step further, which has been alluded to a couple of times. Once I've got the outline types, within a single compile, all of the files are effectively independent. Right? Because to compile class B, I only need the public information about class A. Right? And vice versa. So in fact, I can now parallelize a lot of type checking. And potentially further bits further down as well. But I'm not going to draw two complex diagrams. But my point is, suddenly being able to go for this class, here is the public API, here is all the knowledge, here is the knowledge anybody else needs to depend against it. I can now speed up compilation hugely. And there's, it, it's a really interesting area, and there's a whole bunch of work going on. Um, Jason Zorg's added some interesting, fun compiler flags. So there's, uh, I can't remember the exact, minus X outline type or something. Y minus Y outline to Scala C as a, as a prototype of, of doing exactly this directly within Scala C. But anything we can do to minimize the amount of information, and it, what it will do is if it needs a type, if you haven't described a type to a public method, it will go and do as much compilation as it needs to work out the outline. Which means if your code is completely unascribed and completely public, it's basically going to have to do the entire thing other than the insides of the methods anyway. So anything we can do to help it is going to make our lives easier. Once you get that, so each module is now compiling really fast. But I end up with another problem, which is of what I call build diamonds. If you look at a large trace of the module dependencies in a large code base, you'll find you start with often you'll have some uh, util package right at the bottom some really interesting things, which is might be really fast to compile, but everything depends on it. Right, it's got to go first. Then I'm going to have my core packages. Right, and they're great because I've, I've separated them out nicely. They can all be compiled in parallel. And then I end up with some core lib, which depends on all of those. Right. So it becomes the bottleneck. Right? I, I can parallelize the first step really well, and then I end up with one or two modules, which suddenly I'm, I'm now... I can't do anything downstream until that's done. And then I might be able to branch out again, and then I've got my, my compilation. But this is a build diamond. Right? My, my dependencies on the, on the end are stuck behind this single module in the middle, right? which really limits my parallelization. If I can move stuff around, then I can do a lot more work earlier. And here we go. So I've, I've managed to split. I've realized that there is, there is some dependency. And effectively, with the graph again, the graph knows which modules the code is in. You can work out which things depend, which effectively, within a given module, there might be subgraphs. There might be two independent graphs right, of code. And I can start to separate those out. Or I can, I can suggest to the, to the code author that this, this module can be broken into two. And once I break it into two, I can compile those in parallel, and I have a much better dependency graph. Okay. This isn't a great picture, but you get the idea. I can detect, you know, should a, should a method, should a class be pulled back into an earlier module, forward into a later module, because nobody other than the module at the end actually cares about it? Well, I can compile it later. You know, you can start to jiggle your code, and I think you could even automatically jiggle the code to provide better build structures to optimize the build pipeline. So those are the, 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 the key things that I've been, I've been playing with in terms of the, the fundamental ideas. The, the two key things I think are most interesting in this so far are privatization, you know, minimizing scope, and dead code analysis. Because I think those will provide direct benefit to any, any and all code authors. But in fact, if you go back to the 
the things we were looking at earlier with you know, Scala style, Scala fix, linter. There's a bunch of other things you can detect and infer about code. And this leads to a whole bunch of other potential small, you know, micro optimizations and, and, and tweaks. You know, we can remove unused parameters. I've seen, I've seen code where you've got a, a parameter threaded through 20 methods, and at some point it became unused. But, it's, but you didn't know. Right, so you're still trying to fiddle through what, what, what value do I need to pass here and try and work it through all this code and it turns out that parameter is never actually used anymore. Um, once you've got global analysis, you can actually unthread it. You can just say, this, this is a bit like an unused method. This parameter is unused or, th or this parameter is always seven or always true. Right, so you can remove constant parameters. And you can relax types. So one of the fun ones, and, and actually uh, Diego uh, suggested this, as I say, as a, as, a, as a feature request on the code base before the code base was even working, which is if you've got a method that takes a B, and B is a subclass of A, but you only ever call A methods on it, then you can replace the, the, the B with an A and you've widened, you know, you've relaxed the types. You know, you've, you've, you've compiled to the interface, not the implementation, potentially. So. so this is all fun. So what have I learned on this journey so far? Actually, I learned some of this from, from Enzyme as well, which is tooling, and I'm sure Olaf would agree, tooling is really fiddly. You find all the sharp edges in types and jars and representations. You know, the, the fact is I ended up with a semantic DB symbol, a Scala C symbol, you know, and a, and a Java reflection symbol. And they're all re I know they're the same thing, but because of erasure and all the other things, it's really actually hard to tell or prove. So I, I, I'm still working out how to deal with some of those edge cases. But that's all. The interesting part is that's all in the analysis phase. It's all about pulling out the information about what this code means. And there's various ways of doing this. You could go back to the compiler plugin. You could go back to compiler plugin because you have a lot more information in one form at that point. You could add more to semantic DB. You know, depending on where the information should be, there's a bunch of stuff to do. But it, it turns out sometimes this stuff is just fiddly. And anybody that's dealt, dealt down, at, down at the bowels knows that you, you've got a, jar, a Java jar and a Scala program, and the types sort of match up. And for example, one of the things I found with uh, Scala Meta or Scala Fix is I couldn't tell when I've got method, uh, a method overriding a parent method which one it overrides. And if you've got two with similar names, it's actually really hard to tell exactly the, the exact hierarchy and, and it's not the, the information doesn't exist in semantic DB at this point. And so as I said, reverse engineering this information is just really painful. So what next? Well we continue development, getting more data. My my goal my next goal is to make this work on the ACA code base. As I said, the first time I tried to run it on Acker, it blew up in new and interesting ways, and I'm still working through that. But hey, that's, that's real programming, right? It worked in the tests. And then testing it on even bigger code bases, um, the community build, for example, would be a fun thing to run this on. And, and seeing where the data leads. Cause I think once you have the, the information, I think there's a bunch of really interesting stuff to do. Um, as I say, whole program static analysis. I think it's a really interesting space. I think there's a whole bunch of things we can detect and determine and infer to make our lives easier, both from a, a sort of development point of view, a code maintenance point of view, and just uh, and all those ways. It's not a turnkey solution yet. The goal is for it to be just another tool that you run. Um, I promise when I get there, I'll tweet about it. And there's lots of things to do. So with that. I want to finish with, with a quote, which is um, 
the founder of Instagram says software is like gardening. One day I'll go behind the shed and clean up, but if nobody ever goes there, does it matter a lot? But I think that's a false analogy. I think it's closer to being, I'm living in a house whilst I'm renovating it, and that there's a few things which bite me every single day when the plumbing doesn't quite work right. And I think you need to go and fix those things. Thank you very much. So we have a few minutes for questions. So, Thank you very much for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I had a question about um, dead, code, dead code analysis, where you said that for reflection or for public endpoints, they needed to be annotated in order to convey to Scala Clean that this should not be considered dead code. And I have PTSD of doing that with ProGuard and Java <laughs> skating tools, and that was an absolute nightmare to get it right. Do you, did you find ways to, to, to work around that? Um, or? So far, for the, the bits I've played with, uh, I've just, for example, either had a, a CSV file, which is like, here are the classes which are considered entry points. So if I have an interface which I pass to other people, I just list that as a, you cannot touch this class. Okay. You know, and, and treat this as an entry point, or, or using an, an annotation to say, this is an entry point, and I'm responsible for... And, and so far, this has been enough. And you don't need to be more fine-grained than that. So, moment, so far, this has been enough. Um, okay. Thank you. Thanks for the interesting idea. Would you mind sharing the repo? Uh, yes, I will, I will tweet it out after the, the talk. Um, it's in my... Yeah, I, I will. <laughs> Thanks. But is it, it's in my... It's uh, github.com slash Rory Graves slash Scala Clean. Uh, but I will... Yeah, I should have put it on slides. <laughs> Are there questions? Um, I guess, I guess, I guess, I, I guess, I, I, I took the um, um, the, the sort of the closed world assumptions as, as meaning that this really applied to, if you like, complete applications as opposed to libraries. But then, in you, one of your last slides, you're saying you, you're going to apply this to Acker. How on earth do you go about um, annotating entry points for something as large and articulated as as, as a uh, as a library, I mean, obviously, yeah. I'm thinking for my uh, my own purposes. You know, I was thinking, well, it's a great tool, but you know, how how do I annotate shapeless for what what are the, what are its entry points? How does that work? Well, the, the thing is, for a for a library like shapeless, I suspect there are there are parts which are things you expect people to call on, and those are going to be your, your your public API to other users, and a bunch of code which is internal implementation detail, and I think you end up having to either list or annotate what those those public classes are, or those public packages. And effectively you say, these are things you know about, and these are these are dead. For Acker, as you say, it's a bit harder because people do extend. But you need to, so you need to um, annotate Acker Actor, because it's an entry point which people extend to write their code. But I suspect when you, when you look at it, there's a, there's a few classes which are entries or extension points and a lot of classes which are implementation detail. And I think it will. Uh, I, I, I accept, yeah, I agree. For, for libraries, this is more complicated. For whole applications, it's, it's easier. Um, and that's something, yeah, it's something that's still open. Any more? No? Excellent. Thank you very much, everybody.